Warning, this video will contain spoilers up to chapter 1038. You've been warned. Hello, my Nakamatachi. This is Joy Girl. So as you guys will know, we are well and truly deep into the Wano arc. I think this is our the fourth year. And what's become even crazier to me is that recently, it feels like we've just been getting huge bombshells after bombshells. And it's funny that I say the word recently because when I actually say that, I mean almost for a complete year. It feels like for a whole year, we've had big reveals, big mysteries dropped on us almost every chapter. And of course, that's standard for a weekly running series. But I don't mean just your usual run-of-the-mill cliffhangers where something big has to happen at the end of a chapter to hook you in to, you know, stay tuned for the next one. What I actually mean is that it seems like every chapter or almost every chapter contains some huge mystery that is still yet to be resolved or has only been teased out slightly further and we haven't actually truly gotten to the bottom of yet. But I think we could actually see this quite clearly through the examples of all the chapters that we got since the beginning of this year. So in chapter 1036, Oda teased out the backstory for Kaido just a teeny bit further, you know, delving deeper into the history between Kaido and King, the knowledge about Joy Boy, their mission, their goal for for the world but without actually truly revealing anything yet and then in chapter 1037 arguably probably one of the biggest mysteries and biggest lore piece that we've gotten was of course the idea of a special devil fruit that even the Gorosei don't actually have a huge understanding of as well as the huge shock of Zunisha arriving at Wano and then in chapter 1038 we had another big mystery of what's happening to Zoro right now it seems like he is facing a grim reaper or someone who looks oddly like a Grim Reaper and whether that is an actual manifestation of death or whether Zoro's just hallucinating or just imagining things of course is unclear but nonetheless yet another mystery has been dropped on us and again I think that's just so crazy because almost week after week chapter after chapter we're left with so many questions that still have yet to be resolved now and I think it's just wild because the way that the fights have been panning out and wrapping up essentially it does seem like Wano is actually going to finish relatively soon so it does leave me to wonder when are all of these questions going to be answered now some of these mysteries I don't think necessarily have to be resolved in Wano they relate to the wider mysteries in the One Piece world such as what happened in the Void Century things to do with devil fruits for example secret races that we hadn't heard about and I'm sure there's room in the series to be touching on these as we progress you know post Wano but then there are also questions and mysteries which are very quite specific to the Wano arc and actually Actually, they've been set up even prior to we arrived on Onigashima. Now, one of the biggest questions that lingers in the back of my mind about this arc is actually about the Poneglyphs. And I'm not even just talking about the road Poneglyphs, although that in itself is a really interesting question because we haven't yet found the road Poneglyph, despite the fact that we have now found two Poneglyphs on Wano. But actually, even the discovery of these two Poneglyphs, in my opinion, is actually a huge deal. And I don't think they actually get enough attention. Because of the fact that we have now been introduced to road poneglyphs and we know how essential they are to finding Laugh Tale, to finding the One Piece, I think standard poneglyphs that we had been accustomed to, that we had been introduced to prior to that point, have taken a bit of a back step. And I don't think they quite spark the same amount of desperate mystery as they once might have. And I think this could actually apply to both the series as well as the fan base. But personally for me, this has been a question that I've had ever since we found these Poneglyphs. Because prior to finding out about the role of the road Poneglyphs, Poneglyphs were a really important, really helpful plot device, a way through which we found out so much valuable information. It's how we found out about the ancient weapons, for example, about Joy Boy, these promises, the ancient world. They were a big deal. They were primarily the vehicles through which we found out more about the ancient world, about the Void Century, about the bigger mysteries that would come into play. And it seems like that is sort of the role of these normal poneglyphs. They're ways to tell the world's story. So I think it's natural to assume that these two that we found out Wano will play a similar role in sharing something about the world's history. And given the fact that we are in Wano right now, a country which has such close intrinsic links to what happened during the Void Century, 
it's possible that this may actually be the way that we find out about Wano's closed border policy, what happened to make them isolationists, their relationship to the Great Kingdom, and so on and so forth. Essentially, I think they're actually going to be a quite helpful piece of the mystery of the storytelling in this arc, or at least I hope so. But then even going back to the road poneglyph, because of course we haven't found the road poneglyph yet, that also poses some mysteries and it raises some interesting questions now, I think in particular, because of what we've seen recently. And what I mean by that is actually the arrival of Zunisha. So far when we've seen road poneglyphs, they have been really closely connected and tied to the voice of all things. We saw this at Zo when we saw the group nearing the whale tree, getting closer and closer to the road poneglyph. And then we also saw this during Odin's flashback where both Roger and Odin with the voice of all things because they were getting closer to the road poneglyph in Fishman Island. So I think it's interesting that we're seeing Zunisha arrive at Wano now and it does make me wonder if this means that we're getting one step closer to finding the road poneglyph or if they're going to be connected in some way. But then speaking of Fishman Island, there's another mystery that I've had, you know, sort of tinkering away in the back of my mind almost since the beginning of the arc. And this is because of a parallel, a very loose parallel, mind you, but a parallel nonetheless that we could make between the arcs of Wano and Fishman Island. Because just like we saw the Kraken Surume at the beginning of the Fishman Island arc, who played a hindrance for the Straw Hat crew, we got a quite similar occurrence of something like that happening at the beginning of Wano with the octopus who caused difficulties for the Straw Hats or primarily Luffy at the beginning of Wano. If you guys remember, it was a bit of a gag that there was an octopus that they found somehow aboard the ship. And then when they were trying to hurtle themselves onto the island, that octopus held Luffy back, which is how Luffy got separated from the crew. So the existence of these sea living creatures, and I have to say the quite similar roles that they played at the beginning of the arcs, it did always have me wondering whether the octopus was a lot more relevant to the story than it initially seemed. You know, why did it hold back Luffy? And are we going to see it again? Now, I do think there is a high chance that it actually won't be relevant. We do see quite similar octopuses, no, octopi, octopi in the bathhouse later in the Wano arc. So it could be possible that octopi are just are just common features, are just common creatures that you find on the island. But I still have to say that it just does seem a little bit suspicious. And actually, I'd be curious as to whether I'm the only one that's been thinking about the octopus this way, or whether this has been a question you guys have had as well. Had you ever paid attention to that octopus? Did it ever cause a little bit of curiosity, a little bit of suspicion in your mind? Or do you think we'd be reading too much into things? And it is just simply, you know, a fun feature, a fun fact, just a way to propel the story forward because Luffy had to be separated from the crew and then the reappearance of some octopi later on the arc is just credit to the fact that obviously octopi are just really prevalent in Wano. Because then a similar question could also be then asked of Koyama and the mountain god because after seeing them at the beginning of Odin's flashback we do of course see them again and we see that they've maintained a relationship with Odin and the rest of the scabbards and I always found that such a cute detail but also quite an intriguing piece of detail. Similar to Sur are we going to see them later on in the arc? Are they going to play a bigger role? I will admit that probably seeing them again during Odin's flashback just made me a little bit more invested because in saying that, a large part of me does think that it is quite unlikely that they are going to be relevant again and it's probably just one of those instances where Odo is just paying so much close attention to detail and it's just a fun feature of, you know, consistency that he wanted to bring into the arc. A level of that flavor of, you know, things wrapping up, things tying up really nicely. But then of course, it is Oda, so you never know. And then if you go down that route, I think there are so many different, really intriguing questions you could ask. For example, we have the huge skull and the Tori gate at Onigashima, even the sacred tree at Onigashima. And it does make you wonder whether these elements, whether these artifacts are going to be relevant, whether they're going to be relevant to the formation of Wano, to the formation of Onigashima, how these islands came to be. And I think these are probably examples of things that will actually come into play, something that we will find out more of a backstory about, especially because I think it's likely that it's going to be connected to the history of Wano and what happened in the past to make them shield themselves against the rest of the world. Whereas on the other hand, there are some examples where it just doesn't feel quite as likely that we are actually going to get a fully fledged, a full fleshed out backstory or details about. And we do know that Oda has obviously done this before. For example, in Thriller Bark, at the end of that arc, we got the mystery of those 
dark, huge, shadowy figures, and we still don't actually know what that is about. And I know a lot of people in the community actually never want to know because it adds to the level of intrigue and flavor and mystery into the world of One Piece that makes it such an intriguing and colorful place. And I know a lot of people don't feel like they necessarily have to find out what that is about. It's also true of Oda's side characters. Apparently Oda has full backstories and has fully characterized all of his secondary, all of his side characters, but we just don't have the time and space in the series to actually go through all of them. And of course, the perfect example of when Oda actually decided to share that backstory with us is of Senor Pink in Dressrosa when his editor actually said, you need to include this in the story because it's just fantastic and you know thank god that he did because it is fantastic but then when you think about it that way it does actually have me wondering about some of the characters in Wano that we were introduced to in this arc and whether we're ever going to find out the full details the full backstories behind these characters there's Ulti and page one for example where we found out through an SDS that these two siblings were actually adopted by Kaido because he knew their parents and because Kaido's backstory still hasn't been fleshed out to us yet there is still a chance that that actually might form part of his backstory. But then there are also characters like Yasui and Otoko, where again, we found out through the Viva cards that Yasui is not Toko's biological father and that she was adopted by Yasui at a young age. And now I might be slightly biased as to why I'm so interested in this story because full disclosure, I did once make a theory video about Yasui adopting Toko. And then almost a week after I made that theory video, that's when that card was released. And so it has been an intriguing detail for me. But even without that, I think given Yasui's character, his tragic but beautiful storyline, I think it is a really cool detail that I'm sure a lot of people would like to find out more about. Was that just a part of his characterization to show what a really stand-up nice guy that he is? You know, just adopting a poor kid in the slums of Ibizu Town, or does it actually point to something further, given the fact that he's a Shimotsuki, a former Daimyo, and all of that? But moving on to a slightly less speculative detail, or less speculative mystery is Hawkins's prediction. Now there is obviously his more recent prediction that he made about someone who has a 1% chance of survival in the raid. And I know there's been a flurry of different theories about who this 1% person could be. And now given the developments that we've had since that prediction, there are quite a number of candidates who could have been the subject of who Hawkins was talking about. For example, it could have been Drake, given the fact that he's now lost to the CP0 recently. It could be Zoro, given what we saw in chapter 1038, and now that he's with the Grim Reaper. And it could be even someone else entirely. You know, someone like Kaido, for example, as a huge twist that the main baddie, the big antagonist of the arc, is actually gonna be the one that has only 1% chance of survival by the end. But the one that I'm actually a little bit more invested in is the one that he he made almost right at the beginning of the arc about Luffy's chance of survival of 19% in one month's time. And the reason why it's been so interesting for me is because I think the key or the answer to that question could play a key part in deciphering how this arc is going to wrap up. Towards the beginning of the arc and towards the beginning of the raid, the idea of the raid failing was a really, really popular idea. For a period, I subscribed to that idea as well. I did think that there was a huge chance that the raid was going to fail and that we were going to have to recoup and have another battle. And one of the big reasons and why I actually thought that was because of Hawkins' prediction. The fact that he said a month's time meant that there was another two weeks left that we were going to have to spend in Wano after the raid because at the time that that prediction was made, the fire festival was to happen in two weeks time, which means that there would be then another two weeks post the fire festival, therefore post the raid. And now in my opinion, it's becoming more and more unlikely that we will actually be seeing the raid fail, which then does make you think, you know, why did Hawkins make that prediction? There's so many specific details in there. There's 19% and then a month's time. What's happening in two weeks time from now that's going to mean that Luffy only has a 19% chance? You know, is it going to be Big Mom? Because a lot of people still seem to think that Big Mom isn't going to be out after this fight with Lauren Kidd and that she is going to remain a villain. She is going to remain at least an antagonist, even if not the main villain of an arc. Or is it going to be the Navy, knowing that the world government are on their way? Is it going to be another big bad villain? Especially given that hint, what the director might have 
have said, it's not quite clear yet, about another enemy after Kaido. And so then is that what's going to happen? And is that what the 19% chance and that specific one month time frame actually referring to? Now, of course, there are a huge buttload of other mysteries that we still have yet to find out. Even Zoro Shimotsuki lineage or connection is still unclear. We've only been teased of it. The idea of Luffy's devil fruit power and the idea of a sun god Nika. And that's actually really interesting because that Shimotsuki question is something that we've been talking about, you know, since the beginning of the Wano arc. And just over over time, progressively, Oda has just been giving us tiny hints, you know, pockets of details here and there, and we still have yet to find out the full details yet. But anyways, given how much mysteries, how many big potential teasers of reveals that have been getting dropped on us recently, it did make me, you know, go back and think about all of the huge and all of the crazy, some of the minute, but really wild, and just ideas that have been eating away at me, you know, slowly but surely. And given the fact that it does seem like the mysteries are still going to be hurt towards us for some time yet, I thought this was a good chance for me to share some of the ones that I already have in my brain so that I could gauge what you guys thought about these topics as well as ask, are there other mysteries in Wano that have been set up at Wano that still haven't been delivered yet and that you're just dying to find out? So let me know by leaving a comment below. Don't forget to like and share the video. Please do subscribe if you'd like more One Piece discussions. You can also join our Joyfully Discord server or even become a patron member and I want to thank all my patrons for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.